Good morning. Good morning. Hmm? Number 348. Number 348. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy. Good morning. It's good to see everyone today, and if you are visiting with us, we are truly happy and welcome you with a most warm welcome. We look forward to getting to know you, and we want you to come back each time you have an opportunity. If you are a, a member of, I'll get it right here in a minute, if you are a visitor with us, please fill out one of those blue attendance cards that you see from the back of the pew in front of you, and of course, members use the light post app or fill out a white card. We'll take them up at the close of our service. Brother Caleb Carley will be speaking to us this morning. His lesson is entitled, Salt of the Earth and Light of the World. Brother Shelby will continue to lead us as we sing praises to our Lord. Brother Alan Varell will be reading our scripture and wording us in an opening prayer. Brother Charlie Neal will be helping us as we partake of the Lord's Supper today. Our contributions will be prayed for by Brother Nathan Mason and our closing prayer, Brother Daniel Rogers. Let's all now join together and make a joyful noise to our Lord. Number 134. 134. Encamped along the hills of life, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hung. Faith is a victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is law, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of joy have tried. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on or every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, your hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hopes of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is a victory. 
victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. The psalm before opening scripture and prayer would be number 841. Number 841. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole day through, there's a silver line that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see, my friend, and trust in his promises grand. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Oft we troubled and tried, sick and sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin and blessed with earthly gain. Take new courage, we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then our heart truly can sing. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth, earth frown and pass us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust him each day, we shall have pleasures untold. And be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. This morning's scripture reading will be from Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its soap, wherewith shall it be, it be salted? It is hence good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden underfoot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set up on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bush, but a candlestick where it give light unto, unto all the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this day and this time in which we have to come and to worship you. Father, we pray that all the things that will be done here today will be well-pleasing in thy sight. Father, we, we pray for so many things 
Today, Father, we, we pray for our country, other countries around the world. There's a lot of conflict, a lot of troubles. Father, we pray that the leaders of all these countries will work together to have peace. Father, we pray for the people that are uh, military, both men and women. Father, we pray that they be kept safe. Father, at this time, we pray for those that are sick of our congregation. We ask you to be with the doctors and nurses that see after them. And Father, bless their families and them as they try their best to get well. Father, we're thankful that for those that have had surgery in the last few weeks, that they're doing much better. Father, we ask a special prayer also for our missionaries. Father, we are blessed to have good men and women who work so hard to teach and to bring others to Christ. But may we not forget them in any way, for their work can be very discouraging some days and pepped up and joyful the other days. And Father, we pray for much joy. Father, we ask you to be with Caleb this morning as he brings us a lesson. And, pray, and Father, we pray that our light does shine, not for our glory, but for yours. And Father, we pray for the elders that lead this congregation. Be with those men and their families, for they have a very large responsibility and a lot of work. Father, bless us. In Christ's name, amen. The song before the lesson will be number 397. Number 397, and please stand if you're willing and able. Number 397. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from his house evermore. But to us he gives the keeping of the light along the shore. Let the
Jesus may be lost. Let the low world eyes be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you And then let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5 and verse 13. You may already be there from our scripture reading a moment ago. I want to welcome all those who are visiting. I know we have several who are guests today. Let me assure you that you're in a place where you will always be welcome and where you will be taught God's Word. Every time you come to a Bible class or worship, you will not get our opinion or our church philosophy or church doctrine. You'll just get, thus saith the Lord, whatever the Bible says on any given matter that we discuss. And we'll try to teach you the whole counsel of God about any particular matter. In other words, it's very important for us to see what the entire Bible has to say about any subject we consider. We can't do that necessarily at every lesson because we'd be here too long, but we do want to make sure that our lessons are Bible-saturated and informed by all the relevant principles that the Bible teaches on a given matter. And today, we would like to talk about our influence. Christian influence. You may say, well, I don't have any influence over anybody. This is not relevant to me because nobody looks to me as an example for anything, but I would challenge that because no man lives to himself and no one dies to himself, Paul says. Everybody has some impact over somebody. And just think about the people who had an impact on you or who still have an influence over what you think and what you do. Have you gone to those people and told them it may be people you don't even know personally, but something you've read or something you've watched that somebody has produced. But it may be a friend of yours, a family member, a loved one, and this person has shaped your life in ways that that person may not even understand. And even if you were to go to that person and say, let me just try to explain to you how much you have meant to me in terms of helping me understand things or helping me know how a person should live or teaching me these various lessons just by your example, that person may have a hard time conceptualizing what you mean. It's hard for you to even put it into words, how much somebody has helped you or had an impact on how you think or what you do or what you believe. So think very carefully today with me about your influence and its purity and the impact you can have for Christ on other people. There's one word I would pick of all the Bible words that have to do with distinguishing the Christian lifestyle and the influence that we have, which should differentiate that from the influence that people who are not Christians have, people who are not members of the church, people who may be religious but who are out in the world because they've never obeyed the gospel and people who do not live according to what the Bible says. There's one word I would pick that would distinguish the Christian from the non-Christian in terms of influence. And that is the property of holiness. Today we're going to talk about one property, holiness, two uh, pictures or metaphors that Jesus uses to help us understand holiness, and then in the third place, three passages that will help us understand holiness and apply the principles to our lives. So one property that every person ought to have, two pictures of it, and three passages about it. First of all, what is this principle called holiness? When you first hear it, it may seem like something that would never apply to any of us. We may think, well, I'm a Christian, but I, I wouldn't call myself a holy person. Or I, I'm a member of the church, but holiness seems like it's on a whole different level. It's a, a higher thing that only certain members of the church, certain Christians achieve. And I don't even strive for holiness. But holiness is something that's to be true of every single person. Hebrews 12 verse 14 says, Pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. It's not an optional matter as to whether you're holy. The Lord leaves a lot of things up to us. A person could choose to be single or married. 
A person could choose to marry this person or that person. A person could choose this type of education or that type. A person could choose one kind of employment or another and be pleasing to the Lord in all those cases. But a person cannot choose to be unholy and still be approved of God. We are required to be holy. And in fact, if Jesus is correct in his discussion about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and in his discussion about how many people will be lost as compared to how many people will be saved in Matthew 7, our holiness must exceed the holiness of those people around us. It's ever been the case that God expected holiness of his people. Holiness is that property of being separate or distinct, from the people of the world. Holiness is being consecrated to God or set apart for his purposes. Where we are in a different category. God says, I am specifying you as the people who are committed to being like me. Everybody's obligated to be like God, but here are people who are set apart and to whom God would ascribe holiness. Some holiness, uh, one type of holiness we receive when we become a Christian. That is, God keeps us pure of our sin. God has cleansed us of all of our unrighteousness. When we obey the gospel, we've been cleansed of our sins, so we're holy. But we progressively become more sanctified or more holy. It's the same word, the same root word for both, sanctified and holy. We become progressively more sanctified as we live and apply God's principles to our lives. In the Old Testament, God says in Exodus 19, 6, Be holy. As I am holy, God expected his people in the Old Testament to be that way. And in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, Peter applied that same principle in the New Testament age. He said, you must be holy because your Father in heaven is holy. Now this doesn't mean that we must be in a high church context with a lot of fancy architecture. It doesn't mean that ladies should be nuns or that people should be priests in the secular or in the um, typical religious sense of the word priest where he wears special clothing or something like that. That may be the idea we have when we think about holiness or we may think of somebody who lives an ascetic lifestyle who withdraws from society and goes and lives on a hillside in a monastery somewhere. When we think of holiness we think of that type of lifestyle but holiness is much more than that and different from that and actually no holy person in the New Testament ever did that we never read of a holy person in the New Testament who separated himself from society so as to have no contact and we never read of a holy person in society who set himself up as some kind of unauthorized ruler over the church now that wasn't the case a holy person is just a Christian A holy person is someone who has given his life over to Jesus. A holy person is just part of that royal priesthood called the church, 1 Peter 2, 9, a holy nation, a holy people for God's own possession so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us into his glorious light, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. So every Christian is to be a priest. Every Christian is holy. Every Christian is a part of this royal group of people God calls the church. So holiness is the expectation for every person. Now, holiness requires distinctiveness. It's the whole idea of holiness or sanctification is not sanctimoniousness or holier-than-thou attitude. It's just a separation. It's just a different commitment that we are holding ourselves to a different set of values. And so we will have a distinctive kind of lifestyle. I mentioned a moment ago that some people have the wrong idea of holiness where they think it's like a high church setting or it's a, an ascetic setting or it's like off in a monastery or in an ivory tower somewhere. That's false. But there's another misunderstanding of holiness that people could have where they think that holiness is nothing different than niceness or kindness. They kind of deflate the idea of holiness to where all it is is that you're a pretty good person to be around and you don't break the law and you keep up with traditional morality. You behave basically the way polite people in your society behave. And that's not holiness either. Christianity is something different. It's distinct from all that. You can get politeness and kindness and niceness from practically any religion or from secular humanism. You don't need Christianity to be a polite, nice, kind person who doesn't hit people. What you need is God's Word. And commitment to God's Word, living according to that standard, is the distinctiveness that's required of every person that we give attention to God's Word and then live by it. That's holiness. So I want to clear away 
possible misunderstandings of sanctification. Again, not sanctimoniousness, not holier than thouness, but a different commitment to different principles that will result in different habits, different patterns of living. And we'll have sermons on this from time to time where we talk about practical applications of this. What would holiness dictate, for example, about the clothes that I wear? Or what would holiness dictate about my choices in entertainment? Or what would holiness dictate about my worship? What would holiness dictate about what I put into my body? What would holiness dictate about and go on down the line? And we'll have lessons on those types of things, but this is a principles lesson. This is a lesson where we stand back and say, what are the guiding principles that will dictate how I behave and how other people will observe my behavior in my life? So the one word we want to have in front of us is sanctification or holiness. That's the property. But now let's look at how Jesus illustrated holiness in the Sermon on the Mount. He gave us two pictures, and we want to investigate those two pictures and think about why Jesus would have chosen salt and light. Let's read the passage together, beginning in verse 13. And by the way, we just finished studying the Sermon on the Mount in our Footprints of Jesus study. So if you've been following along in that study during the last three weeks, you've done a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter analysis of what we might call the greatest sermon ever preached from Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And every section of that is power-packed, it's practical for the Christian life because it's sort of like a constitution of how Christ's followers will behave. If you're a disciple of Jesus, what will your life be like? Kingdom principles. So we're drawing from that passage as we read about salt and light here. Jesus says, you, talking about his followers, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Here's the second image. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven." Now, both of these are brilliant metaphors. Let's take them one by one and think about why the particular metaphor of salt is applicable and then how much we learn from the principle of light for how we are to live. First of all, with salt. Salt is good. I didn't have to tell you that. You know that salt is good. Jesus said it in Mark 9, 50. But why is it good? And why would Jesus have picked it out? Well, first of all, I would suggest he picked it because salt is necessary for life. More directly speaking, sodium is necessary for life, but we get most of our sodium from our salt. You may get it from other ways, but basically speaking, practically speaking, for the average person, eating salt is necessary for life. And having Jesus in our lives and living by his principles is necessary for our spiritual life. We can die spiritually. It's possible for someone to be dead even while she lives. Paul explained in 1 Timothy chapter 5 of a Christian woman who became unfaithful. She's dead even though biologically she's alive. Spiritually speaking, the salt of Christianity which seasons our lives is necessary. In fact, in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, we read that while we're in the world, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. So if we're spiritually dead, we can't expect people to come to Christ by observing us. So we have to have that saltiness. So it's necessary for life. Number two, it is pleasant to the taste. I've heard it said that salt is that substance which makes food taste bad if it's not on it. And salt is certainly tasty, and we want to salt our food, or we want to eat things that are well seasoned. C.S. Lewis said, how little the person knows who thinks that holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. It's so pleasant to be around somebody who's a faithful Christian. Even if that person has few similar hobbies or backgrounds or maybe we're at different socioeconomic levels, we enjoy being with Christians because they have our best interest at heart. It's so wonderful to talk to a person who only seeks your good, who only pursues your welfare. He's not talking to you to show out. He's not talking to you to see what he can get from you. He's not trying to get back at you if you've ever done something wrong to him or to her. The person just loves you. 
The person just thinks about how you can be a stronger person, closer to God. And he wants to share in fellowship with you so that you can urge one another on in every good thing. So a person who is urging you on to heaven is just a delight to be around. And that person is not self-conscious because he knows his value doesn't come from what you think of him. His value comes from his creator who made him in his own image and who sent his son to die for him. So his self-esteem is not hinging on what you think of him or what you say to him and vice versa. So that's the basis for a strong relationship. Salt is so pleasing. But then salt is also a preservative. It's put on meat to keep it preserved, especially when we don't have the refrigeration like we have in the ancient world. They didn't have the refrigeration that we enjoy today, so salt was used more for a preservative. And in the Old Testament, God's covenant with the Israelites, which was to be a perpetual statute throughout their generations, was called a covenant of salt. 2 Chronicles 13, 5, Numbers 18 and 9, uh, chapter 18, verse 19 applies that specifically to God's covenant with the priests for their provision. And God, in telling the Israelites how to provide for the priests on a regular basis, that the priests were to receive a portion of all the people's goods so that the priests could live from the proceeds of the people and do their work around the tabernacle and later the temple. That agreement, this is fascinating to me, that agreement is called a covenant of salt. Now, let's say I'm a priest in ancient Israel. I would be so thankful that it's a covenant of salt because that indicates permanence. And that indicates that, for example, the sons of Reuben know that they are to contribute something to take care of the Levites who are priests. And the sons of Judah and the sons of Benjamin and all of the tribes know that all through the generations they are to contribute to my sustenance as a priest. And the reason that's guaranteed is illustrated by it being called a covenant of salt. And Christianity, the saltiness of Christianity, the holiness we're talking about, does have a preservative impact in our society. We might say our society is getting more sinful all the time. You might say that it's like a, a sewer pipe has burst and spilled filth all over our society because sin so saturates the media and so saturates the culture. But yet there are many Christians in society. I remember back in Genesis 18 and 19 that God preserved or was willing to preserve. He didn't actually do it, but you know he was willing to pre preserve Sodom and Gomorrah if there were just a few righteous people. Got down to ten righteous people in his discussion with Abraham about it. God would have preserved that nation if just a few righteous people were found. But there weren't that many righteous people to be found. I wonder why God allows such a wicked nation as ours to continue. It may well be because there are so many Christians in our society. There are so many faithful congregations like the one of which we're a part who are making a difference, who are converting people, who are having what we might call a preservative influence in our society. Well, that would just indicate saltiness. But number four, notice about salt, it's different from the food that it flavors. If you had meat-flavored salt, <laughs> that would be impossible, but let's say you could have meat-flavored salt, you wouldn't want to put it on the meat because what you want to put on there is something that tastes different. And if Christians are just the same as everybody else in the world, well, then they're worthless as an influence. That's part of the point of Jesus' discussion here. Uh, salt that's not salty is not worth anything. Christians who are no different from the society in which they live are not worth anything. Remember, Jesus prayed about his apostles in John 17, 13 to 21, that they would be in the world, that they would be mixed in with all the worldly people, but that they would not taste like the world, that they wouldn't be the same as all those people. So there ought to be some marked differences so that the salty influence of Christianity can have that effect. It ought to be that a Christian doesn't talk like the worldly people around him, that he doesn't espouse the same positions as those who are around him, that the Bible circulates in his mind and he's bringing up biblical principles and speaking a word for the Lord in conversations where the worldly people who are talking would never say those things. Where people after being with a Christian would walk away and say, wow, he's different. Or, well, she says things that nobody else would say. Why? Because they're the salt. 
They're the influence. They're the things that taste different from the rest of the food. They're mixed in there with the food, but they're not the same as the food. So that's why Jesus uses this metaphor, I suppose, of the salt. And then notice that salt is ineffective in a clump. I don't know if you use a salt shaker at your table, but if you do and you shake it, what do you do? You, you shake it where the salt goes all around the food. You don't put it just in one little spot on the side of your plate and then take a spoonful of salt every now and then as you eat your lunch. That's not what you want. You want it to be spread out. And the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 19 instructs about the sprinkling of the salt. We talked about the Great Commission in Fundamental Sunday last week where Jesus said, go into what? Go into all the nations and baptize them, teaching them to obey all the things that I've commanded you. Well, Jesus is saying, don't be just in a clump. You can put Matthew 28, 19 and Acts 8, 4 right next to each other. Do this sometime. Do, look at Matthew 28, 19 and then open to Acts 8 put them side by side, and that teaches that those who were scattered abroad at the persecution that was instigated by Saul after the stoning of Stephen, they went everywhere preaching the word. Well, that shows that they were just doing exactly what the Great Commission said. So they were not in a clump. They didn't just stay in Jerusalem. Jesus had said in Acts, uh, Acts 1 and verse 8 that you will be my witnesses where? The church would spread first in Jerusalem, and then in Judea, and then in Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. So that by the time you get to the book of Colossians, in chapter 1 and verse 23, just a very few years after the church had been established, Paul was able to say that the gospel had gone into every nation under heaven. It was just going all over the world. And indeed, that this is I don't want to talk too much about this because we have limited time. We have manuscript evidence from all over the, the ancient world of the New Testament, from early Christian centuries and quotations of the New Testament from those men we call the church fathers. They're fathers in the historical sense, but early Christians where they're quoting from the New Testament. In fact, all of the New Testament books all over the ancient world. That just shows that what Paul was saying was true. The New Testament books were being passed around in all of these different countries. That's because they understood this principle that salt is ineffective in a clump. But then finally notice about salt that it's worthless if it loses its flavor. Now salt, properly speaking, cannot lose its flavor. Salt is just salt until it just dissolves away. But it can be diluted and it can be separated from impurities so that you lose the salt and you just get the impurities that might have been baked in there. But what I'm saying is, I think the main thrust is not the separation of the flavor from the salt so much as this point. Salt cannot be salted to add flavor to it. In other words, salt just is the flavoring. And if you can't get your food seasoned with salt, then there's nothing else to add to it. You're, you're at a loss. There's nothing to salt salt with. Now, why is that important? Because if we walk away from Christianity then we lose our possibility of salvation and saving others. The only worthwhile influence I have in this life is helping people become Christians. The only thing that will matter in eternity is whether I was salty. The only thing, just go 100, 200, or however many years it is until Jesus returns, the only thing that will matter when Jesus returns is not how much money I made or what a big house I had or how famous I was or how well-known in the community I was or how respected I was. Those things may be nice, but they don't matter. Ultimately, what matters is, did I have the salty influence to bring people to Christ? And if I didn't have that influence, there's no other salt that I could add that would do any better. It reminds me of Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, and Hebrews 10, 27. I'm not going to read those, but you can just write them down. It's about Christians who leave the Lord, and it's about how there's no way to restore them. And what's meant there, and we have a QA and a about that tonight, so I'm not going to talk much about those passages because somebody already asked about them, and I want to talk about them tonight. But in those passages, the Hebrews writer is saying, if somebody leaves Christ, there's nothing better he can go to. And there's no possibility of him being saved by anything else. In a way, it's another way of saying if the salt loses its saltiness, wherewith shall it be salted? What else is there that's advantageous? 
if you leave the Lord by comparison, everything you're going to is worthless. So if the salt has lost its savor, it's not good for anything but to be trodden under the foot of men. And that same thing could be said of everything we may prize. Take away Christ out of the equation, what is our money worth? It's not worth anything but to be trampled under foot of men. Compared to the value of the gospel, if I miss out on Christ and I miss the gospel, what good is my achievement? What good is my diploma? What good is my award or my trophy or anything like that? What good is my fame or recognition? It's not worth anything. It's just to be trodden under foot of men. Because compared to Christ, all those things are worthless. But put to good use for Christ, all those things become very valuable. They become salty. They become tasty. I can use my job to glorify Christ. I can use whatever recognition I may have to honor Christ. I can use the physical, material resources I have to advance the cause of Christ. All of those things become flavorful again because they're put to good use. So you see how this metaphor of the salt can be very effective. It shows how I'll be different from the world, but also be very helpful to the world. Now let's shift gears. I'd love to talk about salt for the rest of our time, but because we have a limited time, let's focus on the light now for a minute. Jesus says in the next place, not only are you the salt of the earth, but you're also the light of the world. Why would Jesus have picked the metaphor of light to help us understand Christian influence? Well, first of all, light shows us how things are. It lets us have an understanding of reality. In Matthew 6 and verse 22, Jesus said that if your eye is clear, then your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, then your whole body is full of darkness. I mean, if you, if you can't let light into your understanding through your eyes, and we, we pity people who are, are vision impaired, and they may not desire our pity, but we do pity them because they're missing out on an advantage that we have in the sense that we can move around in the world confidently because we can see how things are. Light allows us to do that. And if our eyes are bad, then at least in that particular aspect of our existence, we are uh, in the negative. It hurts us. Well, the, the light of God's Word and the light of Christianity helps people to see how things really are, that there's an eternity out there, that God is real, that the Bible is God's Word. And we may be the only people who show that light to them. Because they may be so mired down in the daily routine of things and uh, acquiring worldly possessions and trying to accomplish things in this world that they never think about how things really are. That this life is but a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. But the Christian influence says there's something else out there. And what we're living for is not this world. We are supposed to be laying up treasures in heaven. That's only prudential. It only makes sense to be laying up treasures for the future. I mean, remember Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue holiness. It doesn't say, let holiness fall in your lap. It says, stretch out after it. We know what it means to pursue wealth. How do you pursue wealth? Well, you invest properly, you try to save, you try to get the best job you can so that you have as much wealth as you can, and none of those things are wrong in themselves. Remember, they've got to be channeled and used properly. But we know what it means to pursue it. We don't just sit back at home on our easy chair and say, okay, wealth, come to me. Nobody would prescribe that. But as far as spirituality is concerned, some people live that way. They think they can just not give attention to the Bible, not give attention to worship, not give attention to the church, and it will all just sort of come to them. They cannot think about their influence, and their influence will be good. No, the Bible says pursue it. Think about it. Strategize about it. Some people think they can take their children to heaven and never give any attention to the children's spirituality. Grandchildren can go to heaven without parents or grandparents giving any attention to spiritual matters. That's not the way it is. Do not be deceived, Galatians 6 and verse 7 says. Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. And so these illuminating things from God's Word help us see how things really are. Number two, light illuminates a path toward a destination. In Psalm 119, 105, we read, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my footsteps. That shows us where we want to go. So when we try to influence people for Christ, we're helping them to, well, to put, put it as Jesus did in Matthew 5, 16, glorify the Father which is in heaven. That's the target. The target is not for them to become disciples of us. 
In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul said, follow me, but not so you can follow me. Follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, we should be able to say to others, if you live basically the way I'm living, you'll be a Christian. If you follow in my footsteps, then you'll accomplish what I really want you to accomplish, which is not to be more and more like me. Who cares if you're like me? Who cares if you believe what I believe? That doesn't matter. Who cares if you attend the same congregation I attend? That may not matter as long as you're faithful. If you'll be right with God, then it doesn't matter if you're like me or not. What matters is, are you following what the Bible says? And so we're not accumulating disciples after ourselves. We're showing them so that they can glorify the Father which is in heaven. That's why I appreciated what Brother Allen prayed this morning when he prayed about that passage. He said, the glory that comes from our influence is not our glory. The glory is for the Father. And then light is perceptible only in the absence of light. And what I mean by that is if I introduce a light source into a room that's already fully illuminated then the light is imperceptible. For example, if you come into a room that has huge windows and it's a bright sunny day and the sunlight is streaming in in all directions and there's one little light bulb on the ceiling and I flip the light switch and the light bulb comes on, you probably won't even know that I've turned a light on because it's already so light in there. Well, Jesus came into a world that was not light with the grace of God. He came into a world of darkness. John 1 and verse 5, He came in as the light, and the world which was in darkness did not receive Him. He said in John 12 and verse 46 that He came as light into the world so that those who were in darkness would not have to remain there. And God's Word, when... Jesus is revealed, will bring to light everything that's in the darkness. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. So here is light introduced into the darkness, and we have a dark society in which to shine the light. We may say we wish we were born in a previous generation when there was more of the light of God's will and grace in our society. Perhaps that was true, but whether or not it was true, there's always been plenty of darkness of sin in which the light of the gospel should shine. So we should not be surprised at the difference between us and the people who are around us because it's like light in the darkness. But then the last thing I want to say about the light is that it allows us to avoid harm. When we walk into a room with no light and there's furniture in there, then we're going to stub our toe on something or we're going to run into something. It's going to be very painful. If we try to drive a car at night and we don't have our lights on, somebody's going to get hurt. It may be us, it may be somebody else, but pain will follow. And if we try to live life without the light of God to instruct us in our way, somebody's going to get hurt. It may be mostly other people, but at least we'll be lost. And if we do not have the influence of Christ shining out from our hearts into the world, the people who are around us are still hurtling headlong into everlasting destruction. So it's imperative that we turn the lights on. Because Jesus said, let your light shine. So if we're Christians, we've got to be open and honest with the world and say, here's how things really are. Let me tell you about how to be saved. Let me tell you about Jesus. Because if I don't, then you'll still be in the darkness and you'll still be lost. It only makes sense that we want to turn the lights on for protection. But if we do, think about how much better things will be for folks. They will have good relationships. They will not hurt their bodies with substances that will destroy them. They will be secure in their relationship with God so they can have peace in their hearts. They can be assured that their life has ultimate purpose and meaning and value. All of those things will just infuse their lives with joy. So how could I refuse to let my light shine for them? To help them, to invite them into the best relationship that anybody has ever had, one that will persist through eternity. I've got to be open and honest with the light that shines in my heart if I'm a Christian. Okay, so there's our two pictures. We've talked about the one property, holiness, two pictures of it. Now, finally, in the the concluding moments, we have three passages to bring up. Number one is 1 Peter 3.15. It says, Sanctify Christ in your hearts as Lord. A person is sanctified when he's set apart for God's purposes. How do we sanctify Jesus? That means we put him on a pedestal. 
we separate him in our minds from all other concerns. We have a lot of things that are important to us. Maybe sports, maybe politics, maybe our families, maybe entertainment, maybe whatever. Jesus is on a different level. And so we never besmirch his name by treating him as if he's worth less. And if Jesus says something, even if it's not in keeping with societal mores, if Jesus says, do this, and somehow it doesn't fit with what most people do, that's okay, because remember, Jesus is on a different level from my friends. Jesus is on a different level from my classmates or my family. If Jesus says something, that carries infinitely more weight than what my family says or what anybody else says. So sanctify Jesus as Lord in your hearts. Number two. First Peter, or First Timothy, rather, chapter two and verse eight, where Paul wrote to Timothy and said, "I will that the men pray everywhere, lifting holy hands." Now, the praying everywhere, lifting holy hands, is literally speaking a prayer posture, because the New Testament church prayed with different physical postures, and God has never dictated a particular prayer posture. But there's a deeper meaning here, which is a metaphorical one. It's actually a synecdoche. A synecdoche is where a part is put for the whole, where, for example, we say a farmer has 200 hands working on his farm. It doesn't mean he has literal hands. It means he has 200 workers who work on his farm. A part is put for the whole. Here it says, lift holy hands. That represents a holy life. So when I lead someone in prayer, whether it's my kids, or whether it's a congregation of people, I need to have a holy life. I can't even expect the Lord to hear me if my life is not holy, if 1 Peter 3, 12 is true, because his ears will be closed to my prayers. So when I lift holy hands to pray, it's a a holy life that's uttering the prayer. Very similar to the language used in Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. It talks about hands that shed innocent blood. It's not literally the hands, it's the people. So what is my life like? That's a heavy burden on somebody who leads a prayer or who gets up to lead in any area of worship. They're up here leading not because they're prominent citizens or because they give a lot to the church or anything like that. They're up here because they're examples of holiness. And that's a very heavy burden to carry. And the last verse is Romans 12, 2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind happens by ingesting the Word of God. And so the way we can expect to get different, if we say to ourselves now, right now, Caleb, hearing this lesson, I appreciate that I need to be different, but I don't feel like I'm different. I feel like I'm just the same as everybody else. Well, it could be underestimating your own holiness, but it could also be you don't study your Bible enough. It could also be that you haven't put into practice principles in Scripture that apply to you, and maybe that needs to change today. Maybe you need to purify your influence If somebody's influence is impure and they want to make that right, this is an opportunity. Maybe somebody's never become a Christian to begin with and you want to make a change and start following the Lord today so that you can know your sins are forgiven and that you're on the way to heaven. Please do that and start being the salty influence and the light of the world that we know we all need to be. If you need to repent of your sins, to confess Christ, to be immersed into water, we stand here to help you. If you need to be restored or if you want the prayers of the church to help you, we are here for you. Come right now as together we stand and while we sing. Hey, who?
believe, all his name shall rejoice. Quickly arise and awake, calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. You may be seated. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll be singing number 644. Number 644. If you are unable to pick up a communion packet, please raise your hand and the usher will bring one at this time. Number 644. To set the feast divine, the Scripture reading this morning will be 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 27. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks his cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood and body of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come to this part of our worship service, we pray that we allow our minds to go back to the cross of Calvary, to the suffering that Jesus went through when, for us. Father, we pray that you would bless this bread, which to us as Christians represents that body which was hung on that cross. We pray, Father, that we will partake in a way and be pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In like manner, Father, we ask your blessings upon, upon this cup, which to the Christian represents the blood that Jesus shed that washes away our sin. 
Again, Father, we pray that we'll do so in a manner be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Every first day of the week, uh, Christians engage in the worship of giving to the Lord. Whether you've already placed your contribution in the boxes in the back, or you plan to do so uh, after the service, let us remember how we've been blessed. To help us do that, I'll be reading from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Malachi 3, 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be flood in my house, food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Bow with me. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you, Lord, for all the many blessings of life we have. Um, we reflect on those today, how we are so grateful to you as a God who provides for us, uh, help us now as we consider what we, what we have. Help us to give back in a way that's pleasing to you. Let us have the right heart. Let us give with joy. And we pray, Lord, especially for that contribution. We pray that it, it, you would be with the leadership of this congregation, with the elders, and help them as they make decisions on how best to use it. Lord, we pray that you would be with the ministers here. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that you would bless the work that's being done here and especially bless the work that is abroad. Uh, we know, Lord, we have a mission field here and abroad. We pray that you would, uh, your kingdom would be spread through that work. Uh, we most of all thank you, Lord, for the greatest blessing, and that's your son, and giving him for, for our sins. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Brother Caleb, thank you so much for your tremendous lesson this morning. We appreciate your work here. Please pass your cards to the aisles. We'll have them taken up again. Visitors, thank you so much for being here with us. Give us a chance to get around, shake your hand, get to know you, but we do want to invite you to come back each time you can. If you haven't already picked up one of our handouts, do that. There's a good many announcements there with details. I want to mention a few here. Men's quarterly business meeting is today at 1.30. All the men are encouraged to come. Youth have a singing and a devotional at the home of Nathan and Chelsea Mason. This is tonight, following our evening services. The boys' retreat is April the 19th through the 21st. And today is the last day to sign up for that, so please attend to that. Brother Daniel Rogers will be teaching now in the fellowship hall. And Brother Dave Looney will return to teach in the auditorium. So make your plans to attend one of those classes. Fabulous 50s have a brunch at Bake Southern Milling in Martin, April the 20th. And they ask if you plan to attend that to sign up also by this Wednesday. Season seniors will have a fellowship lunch Sunday the 21st. This coming Wednesday is your last day to sign up for that. And Group 5 is hosting that meal. We want to congratulate Jeremy and Madison DeGraves Cherry, who were married yesterday, and we wish them the best happiness in the future. 
That's all I have today. We'll have our closing song, and Brother Daniel will close us in prayer. Let's all be standing. Number 510. Number 510. A hundred stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to who came as fair and happy land. Where my possessions lie We will rest in the fair and happy land By and by Just across on the evergreen shore Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb By and by And dwell with Jesus evermore Filled with delight my soul would hear no longer stay. Though Jordan's waves around me roll, fearless I launch away. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together, that we can encourage one another and strengthen one another. We pray, Father, that our worship has been well-pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Pray, Father, that we've learned things this morning that we can use to bring honor and glory to your name this week as we try to live for you. We pray that you'll bless us now as we depart this place. Bring us back again at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen.